Welcome to the Money Metals Midweek Memo. News and commentary relating to sound money, the precious metals markets, and the economy. I'm your host, Mike Meharry. Thanks for tuning in. The proof is in the pudding. My grandmother used to say that all the time. But you know, I was thinking about it earlier today. It doesn't really make any sense. The proof of what is in the pudding? I mean, milk? I don't know. Well, it turns out this saying is actually a variation on an older saying. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. Now, that makes sense. Proof generally, or at least often, flows out of direct experience. When you can touch, feel, taste, you know it's true. Well, when it comes to gold as an inflation hedge, the proof is in the pudding. I've been writing about gold and silver for nearly a decade now, and I can tell you from experience, there are a lot of naysayers out there, a lot of anti-gold sentiment. You can go back to John Maynard Keynes calling gold a useless relic. Now, of course, he was motivated to say that because sound money is anathema to Keynesians. Governments can't borrow and spend to provide stimulus when they're hemmed in by sound money. Sound money limits them. So, of course, Keynes didn't like gold. But this mentality has actually seeped into the investment community. The mainstream tends to mostly poo-poo gold. You'll even hear absurd things like, oh, gold is a useless metal. And and that's just silly. I mean, there's all kinds of uses for gold in technology, of course, for jewelry. And gold has historically been money for like, what, 5,000 years. Or, you know, Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett famously said, gold gets dug out of the ground in Africa or someplace, and then we melt it down, and we dig another hole, and we bury bury it again, and we pay people to stand around guarding it. It has no utility. Anyone watching from Mars would be scratching their head. Well, there's nobody watching from Mars, so I don't guess you have to worry about being embarrassed by the Martians. But Buffett's opinion notwithstanding, gold is, in fact, an inflation hedge, and it has its place in a well-diversified portfolio. I mean, at least that's my view. Now, you can decide for yourself, as we all should, but I think that if you look at the way gold has performed over time, it's clear that it tends to create this inflation hedge, and it's good to have that in your portfolio if you're trying to preserve your wealth and grow your wealth even in bad economic times. So I'm going to run through some numbers this week just to make my case. But before I get into that, I want to touch briefly on last week's Federal Reserve meeting. It wrapped up last Wednesday after the show was already out, and I didn't really have a a chance to delve into it. So I'm not going to get into a bunch of uh, deep analysis or technical analysis since a week has passed since the Fed meeting, and there have been plenty of people out there doing that already. But I do have to note that it's almost as if the central bankers at the Federal Reserve are just throwing darts at the wall to determine the trajectory of monetary policy. And I'll be honest, I'm not even convinced that there's a dartboard on the wall. Like, they're just throwing darts at this blank wall. Or at least, I think you'd get pretty much the same results if that's what they were doing. And yet, people keep selling gold and silver based on what these people say. And I mean, it's not just precious metals. Virtually every market moves based on the words that dribble out of the mouth of Jerome Powell and his minions over there at the Federal Reserve. So as you know, once again, the Fed didn't do anything at this Fed meeting. All the brouhaha was based on stuff the Fed people said. The official FOMC statement remained, I guess, mildly hawkish, giving no hint that rates are going to come down anytime soon. 
Quote, the committee does not expect it will be appropriate to reduce the target range until it has gained greater confidence that inflation is moving sustainably toward 2%. So, I mean, what does that mean in real life? Nobody knows. You know, uh, next month it might be appropriate. Things swivel on a, a, on a very tight hinge when it comes to the Fed. But that's what they said, and that's really kind of what drove market reaction. In his post-meeting press conference, Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell continued that hawkish tone. Even as the mainstream trumpeted the May CPI report that hinted at some cooling in price inflation, maybe. I'll link to an article I wrote uh, about that CPI report and how I don't think it really necessarily tells us that inflation is dead. Uh, and, And that'll be on the show notes page. But anyway, Powell said, we see today's report as progress. And he's talking about the CPI report that came out uh, on the same day. He said, you know, building confidence, but we don't see ourselves as having the confidence that would warrant beginning to loosen policy at this time. And Powell even refused to take another rate hike off the table, although he did downplay the probability of that more than he did at the last meeting. He said, quote, not to eliminate the possibility of hikes, so still on the table, but no one has that as their base case. No one on the committee does. So it does look like the next move is probably going to be a cut, and I'm, all, I'm certain of it because they're desperate for rate cuts, right? They know, we know, everybody knows interest rates are too high for this economy. Now, they're not really high in historical terms, and they're not even really high in real terms, but they're high when you consider the amount of debt that has been run up in this economy, really incentivized by the Fed since 2008 and even before. So, the big news at the FOMC meeting was the release of a new set of dot plots. And and these are basically just plots. It shows where the committee members are projecting uh, interest rates to move in the, excuse me, relatively near future. So it's kind of showing what the Fed expects to be the trajectory of their rate policies. The last time we got dot plots was after the March meeting. So that was in late March. And whoo, man, what a difference a couple of months makes. It's, it's almost like we hopped into one of those Star Trek transporters and we ended up in an entirely different universe. When we got those dot plots back in late March, there were 10 FOMC members who projected rates would be 4.625% by the end of the year. Now, there are none. So we went from 10 to zero. In other words, nobody expects three rate cuts this year, which was the trajectory that they were talking about in March. And a growing number of committee members don't think there will be any cuts at all. The rest are mostly equally split between one and two cuts for 2024. Now, stop and think about this. Just a few months ago, the FOMC was convinced that three rate cuts were the appropriate trajectory of monetary policy. Now, really, you shouldn't be the least bit surprised by this, right? Fed people are notoriously bad at projecting the trajectory of interest rates even though they're the ones who literally set the rates. Now, how bad is their track record? Well, I've talked about this before. They get these projections right about, get this, 37% of the time. And did I mention that these are the people setting the rates? And yet, they would do far better projecting their own policies based on flipping coins. I got to be honest, this doesn't exactly inspire confidence that these people know what they're doing, does it? Now, you might say, well, Mike, you know, monetary policy is a complex business. You can't expect them to get it right every time. I guess that's a fair assessment. The problem is, it doesn't seem like they ever get it right. Now, Let's be fair. They are trying to balance on a tightrope here. As I've talked about on this show several times, the Fed has not done enough 
to slay price inflation. This last CPI report notwithstanding, again, go read that article and you'll get a better idea of kind of what the bigger picture is. Uh, you know, you got to get past the headlines, right? But think about this. The central bank injected nearly $5 trillion of new money into the economy just during the pandemic, just with quantitative easing alone. I'm sorry, 5.5% interest rates and a modest decrease in the balance sheet aren't going to unwind all of that money. And that's on top of the nearly $4 trillion that the Fed pumped into the economy in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis. And of course, they promised that they were going to unwind all of that. You remember Ben Bernanke was out there and he was saying, oh no, this isn't debt monetization. Once this emergency crisis is over, we'll take all of these assets off of our balance sheet. Never happened. They barely started unwinding the balance sheet back in 2018. And then we had a stock market crash in the fall of that year. And that was the end of uh, balance sheet reduction. In fact, in 2019, the Fed raised interest rates three times before we even got to the pandemic. So the pandemic, I think, was kind of a bailout for the Fed, a bailout for the U.S. government, because the government, the, the economy was on the brink of cratering due to it, it was time, because that's the way the business cycle operates, right? We were at the peak of the boom. It was time for the bust. The Fed was already starting to try to reinflate the bubbles. And then we got the pandemic and it gave the Fed an excuse to inject all of this money into the uh, into the economy. And oh my gosh, we got price inflation. What a shock, right? Again, the Fed has not done enough to unwind what has been more than a decade of exceptionally easy money. And everybody thinks that, oh, we're just going to go back to that easy money. No, no, that was the anomaly. But anyway, the Fed did make monetary policy sufficiently tight to break things in this debt-riddled bubble economy, right? It's already sparked a financial crisis that continues to bubble under the surface. I wrote about that a couple of weeks ago. I'll link to an article about that in the show notes. The world is still buried in debt. We got the uh, the Treasury statement for the month of May. It came out late last week, and we had the biggest May deficit in history. The deficit right now is running about 3% ahead of the deficit that we ran last year, which was huge, especially considering everybody says, oh, the economy's great. When the economy's great, the deficit should be coming down, not going up. And yet here we are. We're buried in debt. It's not just the government. Corporations are levered up. Uh, Consumers are buried in debt. In fact, I think consumers are pretty much tapped out. If you look at the uh, consumer debt data, we've seen a crash in revolving debt, which is primarily credit cards, over the last couple of months. That indicates to me that, you know, People blew through their savings, they turned to credit cards to deal with this priced inflation, and now they've maxed out the credit cards. And I mean, I mean, now what? The only choice is to start cutting back on the spending, and we're starting to see that. That's a really bad thing for an economy that really depends on consumers buying crap in order to keep going. So that's where we are, and this economy was not designed to run in a higher interest rate environment. So there are still all kinds of malinvestments in the economy. What I'm getting at here, it's only a matter of time before this economy unravels. And that's when the markets are going to get these rate cuts that they so desperately want, even though inflation still has a heartbeat. Now, of course, that means even more price inflation, right? When they start cutting rates, when they go back to QE, when they try to bail out the economy, that means more inflation. And here's a dirty little secret. The Fed hasn't even cut yet, and we're already seeing more inflation. The money supply has started to increase again. That, by definition, is inflation. Now, One of the symptoms of this monetary inflation is rising consumer prices, and I suspect we're going to see the cooling reverse, and we'll start seeing uh, sticky price inflation again. And another symptom 
of inflation, of monetary inflation, is rising asset prices. So this might, just might, be part of the reason the S&P 500 keeps setting new records. It's a bubble blown up and supported by easy money, even though we supposedly have tight monetary policy. The money supply, as measured by M2, had been contracting since December 2022, but it suddenly went positive in March. This increase in the money supply happened without the Federal Reserve cutting interest rates. So when the Fed actually gets around to cutting, whether it does it voluntarily because it's you know trying to claim, oh yes, we beat price inflation, or whether they're cutting even more because the economy has gone into the crapper, regardless, that's going to increase even more. We're going to get even more inflation, right? So, yeah, what I'm getting at here is the demise of inflation is greatly exaggerated. And that raises a question. Why do people keep selling gold? Isn't gold supposed to be an inflation hedge? Since mid-2021, we have lived through the worst price inflation since the 1970s. CPI peaked in June of 2022 at 9.1%. Now, keep in mind that after the 70s, basically in the 90s, they re-rigged the CPI formula. So we have a different CPI formula today than we did in the 70s. The CPI formula today understates price inflation. So in other words, if you take the same numbers that we have today and plug them into the 1970s formula, you're going to get a higher CPI, basically about twice. So when I say we had a peak of 9.1%, if you were using the old CPI formula, you'd be talking closer to 18%, right? So it was a lot worse than even the official numbers tell you. But we know that despite this, big money has been selling gold as evidenced by the range-bound price last year and really into early this year. If you keep close watch on the gold price, and if you're listening to this show, you probably do, you know that gold went up and down based on basically the news of the day, right? But the price movement was exactly opposite of what you might intuitively expect if you've heard that gold is an inflation hedge. If we look at the trend, gold sellers prevailed over the last year, year plus, whenever news broke indicating that price inflation was still hot. In other words, you got a hot CPI read and the mainstream would sell gold. You'd see a big dip in the price of gold. We'd see these sell-offs whenever there was a large increase in the CPI or if there was strong economic news, particularly a positive jobs report because there's this weird notion that if people are working, that means we're going to have worse inflation. And, you know, I, I shouldn't have to remind you guys that inflation is caused by the Federal Reserve and governments creating money. It's not caused by people working, but... That's the, way the, uh, that's the way the markets reacted. Conversely, gold buyers jumped in, and, and this is kind of the mainstream market, when the inflation news was positive. So if you had a, a good CPI report, if it looked like inflation was cooling, then the gold buyers jumped in, or if there were hints of an economic slowdown. So what was going on with this kind of what, again, intuitively seems like backward thinking. Well, the mainstream thinking is that any hint of lingering price inflation meant the Federal Reserve would raise interest rates or at least keep them higher for longer. So since gold is a non-yielding asset, higher interest rates tend to create headwinds for the yellow metal. Investors gravitate toward yielding assets such as bonds, thinking they're going to get a better return with higher interest rates than if they just hold non-yielding gold. And I understand this thinking. I mean, it makes sense to some degree. But to this day, I still find it curious that mainstream investors consistently sold a traditional inflation hedge during the worst inflationary period in some 50 years. 
Now, I think at least some of the swings that we've seen in the gold price, and this is probably true all the time and not just in the gold market, but in any market, it's a monkey see, monkey do phenomenon, right? Traders assume that other traders will sell gold on hot inflation news and that they would buy as inflation cooled, so they just program their algorithms to follow that trend. Now, no doubt, there was money to be made following this short-term strategy. If you listened to my show last week, I talked pretty in-depth about the difference between this kind of short-term, play-the-markets, day-to-day kind of strategy, where, again, you can make money, and more of a long-term investment strategy. But these traders didn't seem to be factoring in a long-term trend or an economic fundamental at all. And, and again, it's just a little bit flummoxing to sell your inflation hedge in the middle of inflation. Now, again, you know me, I'm big on fundamentals, and that is indicative of my investing philosophy. I'm thinking long term. I'm not a play the day to day market kind of guy. And again, I'm not knocking anybody who, dis- who does that. Uh, if you've got the time and energy and know how to do it, more power to you. But I think for most people, most people listening to this show, most average investors, they don't have time to do that. They kind of need to lock in some investments and, and, and hope that they gain over the next year so that they can retire comfortably. So, how did investors who bought gold early in this inflationary cycle with this kind of more long term mentality in mind, and, and then held on to it? How did they fare? Well, I'm going to tell you they fared pretty damn good. So here are the numbers. The price of gold has increased by about 29% since June 2021. And that's when inflation really started to heat up. So it it went up from about 1,800 an ounce at that point to today's price. I'm going to use $2,320 an ounce for the examples that I'm calculating in the show today because that's what it was yesterday morning when I did these calculations and and you know by yesterday afternoon gold had gone up another 20 bucks but we'll just we'll just use that 2320 and, it, and it'll give you a really good idea of kind of where we've been from then to now so 29% increase between June 2021 and today in that same period CPI increased by 2.3% And that's based on the official Bureau of Labor Statistics data. So, the price of gold has increased by more than two times the rate of price inflation so far in this cycle. I gotta say, that's a pretty solid inflation hedge and then some. And even if you double price inflation, so you say it's 24%, to keep it more in line with the more honest CPI formula used in the 1970s, you've still kept up with price inflation and gained a little to boot. So, during this inflationary cycle, there's no doubt that gold has served as an inflation hedge, just like it was supposed to. But what if we look at gold's relationship with inflation over a longer period of time? Does the yellow metal still hold up as an inflation hedge? Well, okay, let's back it up. Let's take a little bit of a longer view. Let's look at the uh, price of gold and its relationship to price inflation during the entirety of the 21st century. And I just picked that because it's a nice round number. We can go back to 2000. That was 24 years ago. The spot price of gold on January 2000 was around, get this, $285 an ounce. Can you imagine? Man, I'd like to be able to buy gold at $285 an ounce. So if you bought one ounce of gold that month and you sold it today, again using the the $2,320 spot price, you would earn about 714% on your investment. (laughs) I'll tell you what. I'll take a 714% return, but Mike, what about inflation? Well, during that same period, we've seen a good bit of inflation. In fact, the CPI has increased by about 81%. But 
It doesn't take a math genius to know that 81 is a lot smaller than 714. So again, gold was more than adequate as an inflation hedge during that period of time. And yeah, that's a little bit of an understatement. So here is my caveat. The return on any investment depends on exactly when you buy and when you sell, right? It's true of any asset. You can pick certain dates and make stocks look like an awful investment. The same with bonds, the same with commodities. So you have to be careful about you know just picking an arbitrary time and then using that to prove or disprove whether or not something is a strong, uh, you know, a strong investment option. And a lot of times people will try to trip you up because they'll know, well, this was a really bad year for this asset, so I'm going to pick that date and you know to prove my point. So. Try. It's important not to cherry pick data, and that's why I just kind of randomly picked the year two thousand and uh, and and looked at it that way. But it's interesting because a few years ago, people used to come at me a lot using two thousand eleven to prove that gold was awful, horrible investment. They would tell me, "Just look at gold. I've lost money. You know, this is horrible. Uh, how could you?" promote gold? How can you even think about gold being a good investment? I've lost money, blah, blah, blah. And it's true. For nearly a decade, people who bought gold at the top in 2011 were underwater. Now, here's another point that you should always remember when you're thinking about investments. You haven't lost anything until you sell, right? So, if I buy gold today at $2,320 an ounce or whatever it is, and gold sells off tomorrow, you know, loses $100. I haven't lost $100 unless I sell the gold, right? If I hold on to it, it's just a paper loss. And it's very likely that gold will go back up, and I'll recover that at some point. So don't get in a panic, you know, watching your portfolio or your whatever your investment is and you know, freaking out because, well, it goes way down one day or it goes way up the next and you start celebrating. I mean, that's that's silly. It's not a loss or a gain until you actually sell. I've seen this a lot in the Bitcoin community. I've heard people, oh, I've made, you know, millions of dollars on Bitcoin and and uh, they won't sell it. So they really haven't, you know, made anything. Or conversely, you know, they'll, they'll be freaking out and, you know, ready to jump off of a ledge because Bitcoin crashed. Well, you haven't lost anything unless you sell. So that's an important thing to remember. So if you are investing on a long-term strategy, you don't really have to worry, get too wrapped up in the day-to-day. Now, you can take big dips as an opportunity to buy. That's not a bad idea. But just, you know, you don't have to obsess over every move in the market. But anyway, uh, again, I'll, I'll go back to what I was saying. 2011, uh, people were underwater, and even after the COVID fiasco, you know, gold hadn't gained very much at all. So these people chose 2011 to come at me because gold peaked that year in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis and the Great Recession. So if you did buy gold in 2011, how's that looking today? Well, not really too bad. In January 2011, gold was selling at around $1,400 per ounce. If you bought an ounce of gold then and sold it today, again at that $2,320 an ounce level, you would have charted a gain of 65.7%. Now, in that same uh, period, price inflation has increased by 38.55%. So, again, Pretty good inflation hedge, even if you bought at the top back in 2011, when a few years ago everybody was telling me that was, you know, made gold the worst investment ever in the history of the world. Even if you bought gold at the peak of around $1,900 an ounce in August of 2011, your investment has still slightly outpaced price inflation based on the CPI. Now, If you kind of step back and look at it, big picture, while the correlation breaks down for short periods of time, or even longer periods of time, almost a decade back in the the 2010s, gold has generally outpaced inflation 
during the century. And if you look at a line graph that charts the increase in CPI along with the price of gold, you'll see the inflation line moves up at a relatively shallow and consistent level or a shallow and consistent slope. Meanwhile, the price of gold, while much more volatile, has a much steeper upward trajectory. I'll actually post that graph on the show notes page if you want the visual. It'll be there for you to look at. So, you know, having gone through all of this, I'm just going to throw this out there. Maybe the smart money that was selling gold during this inflationary run wasn't so smart after all. Now, I'm not saying sell everything and put every dime you have into gold and silver, but in my never-to-be-humble opinion, your portfolio should have at least some gold and silver in it. I think 5 to 10% is a good start in normal times, and this isn't normal times. But nevertheless, most people don't have any gold or silver in their portfolio. So if you think inflation is alive and well, you might want to consider getting some gold now and silver too, because as I discussed at length in the show a couple of weeks ago, silver has historically outperformed gold in a gold bull market. So if you're listening to this, you think, yeah, maybe I should get some gold in my portfolio. Now is the perfect time to call Money Metals, talk to a precious metal specialist, just dial 800-800-1865. Talk to those folks. They're fantastic. They'll help you figure out how gold will fit into your investment strategy, what products are right for you. Uh, They're great. We're talking to them, but I know some folks don't like to talk on the phone, so you can actually chat with a precious metal specialist online at moneymetals.com, or if you don't want to talk to anybody, you just want to buy some gold and silver, go to moneymetals.com. You can do it right online. Do it today. So that is a wrap for this episode of the Money Metals Midweek Memo. You can get more information about the stuff that I've talked about today on the show and a lot more over at moneymetals.com slash news. And if you want to get the latest news and information relating to gold and silver right in your email box, make sure you sign up, get on our email list. Of course, you can subscribe to the Midweek Memo on your favorite podcasting platform if you haven't done that already. And make sure you tune into our Market Wrap podcast every Friday. You'll get a quick overview of the week in precious metals, along with conversations between yours truly and interesting people from the world of gold and silver, economics, and investing. As always, I really, really appreciate you taking time to listen to the show. I appreciate the fact that you're taking a little bit of your valuable time to listen, and I thank you for that. So I hope you have a great rest of your week, and I will be back again, back again to talk to you next week.